Well, welcome to the Medigroup webinar series. We're thrilled to have you join us today as we delve into an exciting topic that impacts healthcare professionals in many ways. Our mission is to foster knowledge sharing, collaboration, and innovation within the medical community. Each session brings together experts, thought leaders, and practitioners to explore critical issues, cutting edge research, and practical solutions. Today's presentation is brought to you by our contracted supplier, Diacarta Incorporated, and we have with us Dr. Charles Rosser. Thank you for being a part of the Medigroup community, ladies and gentlemen. Let's begin. Dr. Rosser, take it away. Perfect. Thanks a lot. It's a pleasure to be here to chat with uh, everyone here and to uh, kind of talk about the relationship that I have here with, with Diacarta. So today we're going to talk about a bladder cancer uh, diagnostic. First, to uh, let you know the history of it, the current bladder cancer uh, diagnostics. These are our current diagnostics that are either being used in the clinic uh, and or FDA approved. As you can see here, when we look at the sensitivity numbers, the sensitivity is not where we want it to be here uh, for. And usually it's well less than 50% uh, sensitivity. We say, how can we manage our patients? Uh, with that. But despite that, cytology is done about 1.5 million times here in the United States to help manage patients with, with bladder cancer. So you can imagine this has caused some frustration when we look at these numbers here of, of these tests. And it really set me on a path over 10 years ago to kind of build a better mousetrap or come up with a better urine-based diagnostic to supplant those antiquated tests uh, there. And so I think what we can say here from that previous slide is urine cytology is not a robust diagnostic assay. The other single marker assays, NMP22 and BTA, again, they have their limitations as well. We know that the cancers have multiple genetic defects and even bladder cancer has multiple genetic defects. So instead of looking for just one biomarker, uh, again, this was about 10 years ago, we wanted to look for a fingerprint or a signature of bladder cancer that may consist of multiple uh, biomarkers. So we set out on a very uh, uh, methodical approach here to do this. And you can see the different phases that I'll walk you through here over the next uh, about 20 minutes. So we did our discovery work, early validation. We ended up creating a multiplex immunoassay. And then we did our late validation, which we're still in the process of doing right now. Again, I'll walk you through this here over the next few slides. So again, we started this over 10 years ago, almost about 15 years ago. So back then we didn't re readily have access to RNA-seq, which is so common here. But what did we have? We had microarrays uh, there. And so we started with a group of about 100 patients, 50 cancer, 50 non-cancer there. We took their urine, we spun it down, we got the pellet from that, the cellular pellet, extracted the RNA, hybridized it with the affymetric uh, chip there. And then we ran it and ran our selection algorithm. And from all the genes that's available, out popped a signature of 44 genes. Well, we wanted to then validate these 44 genes. We set out to validate these 44 genes in a multiplex uh, QPCR, looking at these 44 genes, <laughs> independent cohort, about another 100 patients there, 50 cancer, 50 non-cancer. Uh, Again, spun down the urine, got the pellet from it, extracted the RNA did the multiplex PCR uh, there uh, with the RNA. And we were able to validate this 44 genes down to 14 genes. And that's what was done in my laboratory. At the same time, my colleague was looking at proteomics for bladder cancer. So he took those same urine samples. Uh, instead of looking at the cellular pellet, he looked at the supernatant, the liquid portion of it. And he did this with tandem mass spectroscopy there in HPLC. So the first cohort, 50-50 there, ran HPLC. And he was not just looking at any uh, protein. He was looking at the glycoproteins or the secreted proteins. Why? Well, whether we love them or hate them, the, the uh, biomarkers that we're used to, PSA, CEA, CA125, they're all glycoprotein secreted proteins. So we wanted to enrich that population of secreted proteins here. Thus, we looked at that. So that cohort, 50-50, we did uh, tandem mass spec, ran the selection algorithm, and out popped 10 proteins of interest. Again, we had the validation cohort, about 50-50 there to, to validate. We validated. Uh, we always want to use a different uh, mechanism of validating, not go back to 
mass spec. So we validated urine in, using ELISA and Western blot, and we were able to validate all 10 of those uh, biomarkers. But at that time, we were sitting on two large data sets, genomics and proteomics data sets. So we told our biostats, uh, let's integrate this data set and run this selection algorithm again and see what pops out here. And that's what he did. So he integrated the, the, the data sets, ran a selection algorithm, and out, popped out 19 biomarkers. And it was a mixture of RNA and protein. But that's when we kind of hit a pause on this, said, you know what, this is going to make it a little bit complicated for the CLIA lab technician if they have to process a sample for RNA and protein. What can we do here? And so we said, you know, let's give the RNA the benefit of the doubt that it will be translated to protein and just look at the protein of these 19 biomarkers. And that's what we did. So we got another cohort here. All these will be <laughs> independent cohort. This one had about 125 patients, half cancer, half non-cancer. Most of these cancer were high grade, high stage cancer, so very aggressive cancer. And most of the controls were healthy controls there. We said, if we can't see a difference of our biomarkers in this group, we're not going to be able to see a difference. So what we set up to do is, again, we had these 19 biomarkers, <laughs> protein biomarkers. We got ELISA kits for these 19 biomarkers to validate in this group of about 125. Of the 19 biomarkers, we could not get five of the ELISA kits uh, to work. So five dropped out immediately. So we had 14 biomarkers to work with. When we ran it here and uh, we were able to validate 10 of those biomarkers and in this cohort, again, very disparate cohort where it's uh, uh, healthy control, uh, very aggressive cancer, we had a good sensitivity, 92%, 97% uh, specificity there. These are our 10 biomarkers uh, that we're uh, working on. Here, the biomarkers are a gamish, if you will, of um, uh, angiogenic factors and uh, uh, factors that can uh, uh, associate with inflammation or breakdown of cellular matrix. So when you think about it from the uh, cancer standpoint, it makes sense here, these 10 biomarkers that we were able to validate. But then as we're doing things here in the academic uh, lab, uh, we get reviews back from our grants, we get reviews back from our manuscripts, and we uh, were uh, responsive to these reviews, right? Uh, and the reviews came back and said, everything you've done, you've, uh, you haven't taken into consideration benign diseases that could wreak havoc with urine. So what are those benign diseases? What if you have a urinary tract infection? Or what if you have blood in the urine and you don't have cancer or kidney stones? These are things that could throw off those other assays that I showed you earlier. And so that's what we did here. We had a huge cohort, 300 patients, 100 cancer. And these 100 cancers were no longer uh, very aggressive cancer. It was a good mix of aggressive and not aggressive cancer, and then 200 benign samples, and these benign were diverse uh, uh, samples here, again, kidney stone, blood and urine, no cancer. When we ran this on those 10 uh, ELISA kits, we had a decent sensitivity, 74% and 90% specificity. So you could imagine with uh, having less high grade, high stage, the sensitivity would be affected. And then you could imagine with adding in these other diverse benign conditions, the specificity would be affected. But this gave us the green light to move forward. Next thing we heard from reviewers of our papers, of our grants, uh, everything you've done to date, which has now uh, totaled up to a lot of patients, has been done in our lab. They said, you have to go and externally validate this. And so what, this is what we did in this, this study. We worked with a, a group in, in uh, Florida, University of Central Florida, get them access to our kits. They got access to other urine samples because all the other samples came through my clinic. I'm a, a practicing uh, urologist. So they got access to about 300 samples. They were able to externally validate our uh, work, 79% sensitivity, 79% specificity. And that again was the green light to keep moving forward to develop this, this assay. Reviewers came back and said, you know what, everything you've done, you've done with de novo cancer or new cancers there. New cancers tend to be a bit larger, about three centimeters in size compared to recurrent cancer, which is about one centimeter. So they said, look at this in patients with recurrent cancers. And this is what we did with this study here, about 125 patients with a history of bladder cancer on surveillance. 53 of these patients had recurrent cancers. And then when we deployed our assay here at 10 biomarkers, we have a sensitivity of 79%, specificity 88%. 
This one, we were able to compare ourselves head to head. Usually all the other ones, we did compare ourselves at least to cytology here, voided urinary cytology. But this one, we had a unique opportunity to compare ourselves with Eurovision, the fish assay. And again, we outperformed Eurovision and cytology. So now what got reviews back saying, everything you've done to date was in 10 separate ELISA assays. Surely you're not gonna take that to a CLIA lab. And that was never our intent to take 10 ELISA assays to the CLIA lab. The workload would be tremendous. But this is when we set out to build a multiplex immunoassay. Our first partner to help us build a multiplex immunoassay was Mesoscale Discovery, MSD. And so we met with them, they built us a prototype uh, assay and the prototype assay had a, a, a good uh, uh, response here. Uh, and we, they did one round of, of um, optimization here. Uh, we had a small cohort to test out initially 62, but then we had a larger cohort there as, as well. And we wanted to compare and contrast it to these ELISA assays that we ran because we did not want to be missing something as we transition from those ELISA assays to this multiplex uh, assay. And you can see here, we're kind of uh, bang on with the ELISA assay with the uh, similar uh, area under the curve here, 0.94 and 0.92. This gave us the green light to move forward as well. We sent this assay back to Mesoscale Discovery and said, take it through another round of optimization. And that's what we, they, they did. And they gave it back to us. This time, the reviewers of our grants and papers came back and said, Mostly all the patients you have assessed here have been Caucasians from North America or Caucasians from Europe. How does this work in other ethnic groups? So we took this opportunity to work with some colleagues in Japan to test out this optimized uh, multiplex uh, assay here. This had a cohort, almost about 300 patients uh, here, 200 uh, bladder cancer, 69 controls here. And we were able to show in this uh, 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 paper a sensitivity of 85%, specificity of 81%. So we felt very confident with this and we wanted to now move it forward to our ongoing perspective clinical trials that would eventually read out to the FDA. There was a bit of a hiccup here working with, with MSD where they came back saying it may take years, many, many years and millions of dollars to optimize it to get it ready for the FDA. So we were hit with another roadblock. And so this is when we thought, who else or how could we get past this roadblock here? Well, we know about Luminex. Luminex is sort of the world leaders for multiplex uh, assays. And then we know that they have a partner in Biotechni. Biotechni is world leaders for protein-based assay. Most of the antibodies we deployed in this MSD assay came from Biotechni. So we then struck up a relationship between Luminex and Biotechni to recreate this multiplex assay on the Luminex platform. And that's what we did here. So we recreated it. We ran it through one round of optimization with Biotechni, and we were then able to compare it head to head with the MSD assay. <laughs> this is showing you the comparison. And here, surprisingly, the, MS, uh, the uh, Luminex assay did better than the MSD assay. Some would think MSD assay would do better because it does have a pretty cool um, uh, properties, this electrochemiluminescence that will help with the sensitivity assay, but that didn't seem to help in this setting. And so when we talk to the likes of Biotechni and Luminex, the only thing we can think of that how this assay outperformed MSD, our regular, our original assay, was that when we're working directly with Biotechni, they're giving us the best antibodies they have available where when biotechnic works with other groups, in this case, uh, will license antibodies to MSD, they don't really license their best antibodies. They keep their best antibodies. So here it shows that our current Luminex-based assay outperforms that of MSD. <laughs> and so this is what we ended up getting back, optimizing it with uh, uh, biotechni and deploying it in our, our current ongoing uh, studies. And it's the same assay that now uh, uh, Diacarta has brought on board. Uh, they have validated and they're now running it in their CLIA lab. So the next thing we have here is that we have the assay, we've optimized it. Uh, again, the nonagen is going towards the FDA uh, route and sort of thankfully that we're going to the FDA route with everything going on with the LDT and how they want to regulate the LDT. So we already had a lot in place. We ended up doing analytical validation on our tests and, and all of this is, is published uh, here. So if you want 
any of these publications, feel free to, to reach out. We'll get you uh, all of these. I think we have about 30 to 33 publications here with it. But in our analytical validation study that I'm showing you here, we followed the steps that the FDA has set in their guidelines to perform an analytical validation. So we did calibration curve, selectivity, specificity, sensitivity. I'm highlighting sensitivity here because this is what I'm showing you here. Sensitivity is or really how low can you go with your assay in detecting some of these lower limits of, of the, the analytes here. So we were able to do our analytical validation here uh, with the assay. Next thing we uh, wanted to do is look at some of these other assays that are around. BTA, uh, STAT, and NMP22, they're available here. They're FDA approved. Uh, they're falling out of favor largely, and, and we uh, wrote a paper on why they're falling out, out of favor, other than their uh, lousy sensitivity. So this is an, an interesting experiment we did where we took normal urine, spiked it with blood, we also spiked it with cancer cells and we spiked it with benign bladder cells here. And so when we spiked it with blood, we were able to get this BTA assay to turn positive. So it's, there's no cancer there, but it turned positive. So it's really a surrogate of blood, not a, a bladder cancer. So this is why this is not largely used here. And it's a limitation. NMP22, NMP22 stands for nuclear matrix protein 22. This assay is called bladder check. We ran the same uh, uh, ex vivo assay. Uh, the, urine, the blood didn't make it turn positive, but adding these uh, cells, benign and cancer cells, caused it to turn positive. So adding cancer cells, we can say, I can see why that would uh, cause it to turn positive, but why would adding benign cells cause it to turn positive? So it wasn't really showing us a cancer. It was showing us the, uh, the cellular proliferation within a urine sample. So you can imagine you have a urinary tract infection, you have a, a lot of cells there. That in P22 can be positive. Well, we don't want to throw stones living in a glass house here. So we wanted to subject Oncuria um, here to that same uh, ex vivo assay. And we did that. Uh, adding blood to it did not turn it positive. Adding benign cells did not turn uh, Oncuria positive. Adding cancer cells did turn it positive. But, you know, that's what it's supposed to detect. Cancer cells, bladder cancer cells with, within the urine. And so now we have deployed this in a prospective study, about 350 patients, uh, 50 of them cancer, the other 300 no cancer here. And this is showing you we have a very nice sensitivity and specificity here, 93% sensitivity, 93% specificity. Negative predictive values, uh, very high, uh, but the positive predictive value has dropped here at 65%. So the way we're looking at this high sensitivity, high negative predictive value, we're looking at this as a rule out test. We want to rule out who needs to have the next uh, procedure when you're being evaluated. And that would be this invasive cystoscopy, a little TV camera going into the, the bladder. So again, high sensitivity, high specificity for detecting cancers. At the same time, we started work with uh, colleagues from MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. They wanted to know, could our 10 biomarkers be used to determine who's going to do well with a drug called BCG? BCG is a drug we put in the bladder of patients with early stage bladder cancer to try to treat their bladder cancer. And this is a study we did about 70 patients uh, there. And we had an accuracy here of 89% uh, of determining who would respond to BCG. And specifically, we were looking at those who would have a rapid failure from BCG. If you're gonna have a rapid failure from BCG, our thought is, why get BCG? It's futile. You should go to second-line therapy. And luckily, now we have about four to five second-line therapies that we could offer these patients. The other thing we got from reviewers here is that you, they, they said, you know what? You keep saying this is a liquid biopsy. It's a liquid biopsy. You haven't showed me what you see in the liquid. The urine is the same in the tumor. And so what we did is we took an opportunity to take about 300 uh, uh, tissue samples here from uh, FFPE uh, there, and we did immunostaining for our 10 biomarkers. Long story short, the 10 biomarkers are in the uh, tumors uh, there. They're not present in the benign tissues. And it, when it's in the tumors, it could be in the epithelial compartment or it could be in the stromal compartment. The other thing we uh, set out here is we wanted to show that uh, adding in some clinical factors can make the, uh, uh, the uh, algorithm we deploy more robust. 
here. And that's what we're showing here in, in this one, adding clinical factors helped out. So here are the last few slides. Uh, how are we running this here? So we're collecting a midstream voided urine sample from patients uh, in the uh, physician's office. Uh, we're putting those urine samples in four degrees, so in the refrigerator here until it's ready to process. Once we get it here in the CLIA lab, we do one gentle centrifugation, and then we're ready to go with our multiplex assay. We only need 300 microliters of it to run, where something like cytology, typically they want you to have 30 milliliters of it. Fairly straightforward process. So the production of protein-based assays is quite laborious compared to RNA and DNA assay. But running a protein-based assay is a bit simpler here because you don't have to worry about extracting the proteins, amplifying the proteins, and then doing your, uh, your work there. You take the urine sample and you immediately go with that. So because of that, it would take one CLIA technician about a day to run 36 samples in duplicate uh, here. And you can have the readout that later that day. So here, again, these 10 proteins can be used in one of three patient cohorts. Those patients with a history of bladder cancer on tumor surveillance, we have a unique algorithm that can be deployed there. And the output of that algorithm for those patients with a history of bladder cancer would be, do you have recurrent disease or do you not have recurrent disease at this time? Then we have on period detect. That's when evaluate patients with blood in the urine, asking a question, do you have a new bladder cancer uh, there? And so here we have a unique algorithm and the output of this, a high probability of having new cancer, low probability of having uh, new cancer. And the last one is on cure predict. This is the one predict and response to that drug called BCG uh, that I mentioned here. Same 10 biomarkers, the algorithm is different and the output is having a high probability of rapid recurrence or low probability of having a rapid re recurrence there. Again, if you're gonna have a rapid recurrence, it's futile to give you this medication because as we're giving you the medication, the disease can keep growing there and spread. And once it spreads, we're not talking about putting this medication in your bladder. We're talking about removing the bladder or called it a cystectomy. So this is how we're using it. We can determine who needs to have this drug called BCG. This is the readouts that uh, Dia Carter will, will uh, provide. It will tell you yes or no if you have the cancer and then give you a risk score associated with it as well. So I think overall, uh, I'm curious, a more actionable test than what we see here with urinary cytology or, or Eurovision. It aligns with ordering physicians' uh, workflows here. We routinely get urine samples in, in the clinic uh, uh, here. So it really aligns with what we're doing here. And we widely use this platform, Luminex platform, in probably medium to large CLIA labs around the country. So it's, it's good that we have a platform that's widely used here for our assay. I believe that's it for my uh, talk. So I'll be more than uh, happy to answer any questions you have for me. But thank you again very much for your time. Dr. Rosser, thank you very much. What, very fascinating to see the various testing iterations. One question for me, approximately how long is the clinical validation phase? How long does that take? Yeah, the clinical validation phase uh, for us, we started this back in probably about 2018, and we're at the tail end of it. Probably if we had a bit more capital, I think we could accelerate it a little bit more because everything that we've done here has been done with NIH, NCI funds uh, there. But I think what we needed to do is that large cohort, about 350, I told you, and now we want to do a perspective study, and we're about to officially read out this perspective study. So I think typically clinical validation can anywhere be from two to four years, us a bit longer just because of the limited capital that we have. Understood. Very interesting. I don't see any other questions on this. And let me turn to Bridget real quick and see. Bridget, did you happen to get any questions on your end? Yeah, I have just a few. Okay. Um, the, so the first question is, um, how does Zancuria stand out from the rest of the biomarker tests that are either FDA approved or LDT tests? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good question. So the ones that are FDA approved now, there we're head and shoulders uh, when it relates to sensitivity uh, uh, there and specificity we're on point with them but they're using older technology there so I think that's that's the key is is that we need the new technology and the new technology as you know it's a multiplex uh, testing 
So that's the ones that's FDA approved. Now there's some that's not FDA approved here that are using multiplex and they're very comparable to what we're doing here. Uh, a nice sensitivity, 80% plus specificity, 80% plus as, as well. I think how we stand out with them is the point of we're the only multiplex protein assay. So it's, again, it's tough to develop a protein assay, but once it's developed and we deploy it in your lab, it's fairly easy to do because the workflow is a lot easier than having to extract your RNA, check the quality of the RNA, amplify the RNA, so on and so forth. So that's really how we stand out from the FDA approved tests as well as the non FDA approved tests. Okay, thanks. And then the next question is how often should a physician use on on Curia monitor to follow up with bladder mm -hmm. cancer patients. Yeah, so this is the, this is a tough one. So on Curia monitor, that's for those patients with the history of bladder cancer being surveilled. So our guidelines, the AUA guidelines, say once you're diagnosed with, let's say, intermediate or high risk cancer, uh, it's a very aggressive cancer. You need to be seen every three months for two years every six months for two years and every year thereafter for the rest of your life for us to take a look into the bladder with the little TV camera there in the clinic to make sure there's no tumors. So our thought process is instead of moving directly to this invasive test, get on curative monitor first, let's say a week beforehand here, and then the patient and the doc could sit down at the time when you're supposed to do that cystoscopy and say, hey, based on this is say, I have a low likelihood of having a cancer. I would like to stand down and not do my cystoscopy at this time, realizing that they're still going to come back and see us in another three months, for those patients with intermediate and high risk uh, cancer. Those patients with low risk cancer, the uh, follow-up isn't as intense as every year uh, for it. But again, we're going to follow them up in another year there. So we have the potential of standing down instead of uh, uh, doing this invasive procedure called cystoscopy. Mm -hmm. And then the final question is, how exactly does the Oncuria predict guide urologists for BCG and maybe other drug therapies? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good question as well. And it's a timely question because this BCG uh, 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 therapy that we have, it's a generic uh, drug. We've had it around for forever since the, the 60s and anywhere else in the world, this BCG is actually the vaccine that we would give for TB. We don't have a lot of TB here, thank God. So we don't use it to as a vaccine for TB, but it was the first immunotherapy uh, around. Uh, but because it's generic, we're in the shortage of BCG here. And that has created problems for treating physicians that sometimes I don't have the BCG to give the patients that, that need it uh, uh, there. And so what we're looking at is, in, again, instead of giving a drug to a patient that may not respond to it, uh, again, it'll be futile uh, there by keep throwing drug at them. And we know we have a drug shortage. What we're hoping to do with Oncure Predict is alert the docs of the patients who aren't going to respond to it. So at that time, the, the doctor can sit down with the patient and say, you know what, <laughs> you have this cancer. We would normally treat you with BCG, but looking at your molecular profile here, you're not going to respond to BCG. So now we're recommending maybe going to another uh, uh, drug. And now there's been a slew of new immunotherapies to help treat this type of, of bladder cancer. And so they can say, instead of getting BCG, now you can go with one of the newer immunotherapies to see if you're gonna have a better chance of responding. And, and there's always at the end of the day that if this cancer is too aggressive, it's going to be the bladder cancer removal uh, here. So what we really see is that we're interjecting ourselves as the doc is uh, scratching their head. Should you have BCG or should you not? Realizing there's a BCG shortage, the test will say, uh, yes, you should get BCG. No, you won't do well with BCG. Divert them to another type of therapy. Yeah, very interesting on that part, seeing as they wouldn't have to go through that waiting period to see if that drug would work before moving on to the next one. So very cool that uh, exactly. you have thought of that 
in, in it, the exactly. Testing. And it would take about six months before you know whether BCG is working or not. But during that time, if it's not working, there's a good chance that disease is growing right. and just spread there. So we don't want that to happen. So yeah, I think this is what we we want to do. This is it makes us unique. No one has a, anything like that out there. The docs love it. And this actually what got us FDA breakthrough designation status at the FDA, I believe back in 2022. Uh, wow. There it is a sorely needed diagnostic here in this space. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Thank you so much. And Frank, that's all the questions I have. Thank you, Bridget. Dr. Osser, this was fascinating. Thank you very much. Our members will be very appreciative of this information and presentation. So thank you for the time and way. Thank you for coordinating this and look forward to hopefully talking to you again soon, Dr. Rosser. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have You're a good welcome. day. Yes, sir. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye for now. Bye.